here to our training and podcast episode today, the marriage makeover, three simple habits for a happier relationship. I'm Heather Cho with Mark Johnston. How's it going, Mark? It's going well. How are you doing, Heather? Doing really good. Had a fun day at the duck pond with my kiddos because it's finally warm enough. Oh, really <laughs> like been here, miserable in Colorado. <laughs> here it's gotten like super cold. I actually built a fire this morning in, in our oh, fireplace. Yeah. Just to, There's a big uh, storm up there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we are excited to share this with you. Our podcast here is The Thriving Marriage. We're on episode 155 and we have helped tens of thousands of couples now with this proven method. What I'm really excited about, Mark, is that we talk about the thriving marriage and more often than not, we're talking about how to stop a divorce, right? So today we get to go a little more into how to have that thriving marriage and a happier relationship, no matter where you are at in your relationship. So before we get to that though, we're going to share a client win of the week. This one comes with permission from Farron. I'm going to share this one. He says, we, my wife and two daughters sat in front of my house for about 45 minutes, having a great time telling stories and tons of laughter. When they left, I came inside thinking our thanking our father for his hand in this. I'm seeing the woman I married. Uh, Farron shared his story with us on our podcast a couple of years ago, actually. And his wife was like dead set on divorce, would not talk to him, was not willing to work on things with him. And so to have these really, wow, I don't know what that sound was. Pod, okay. <laughs> this is live. So <laughs> I don't know what technology is beeping at me, but <laughs> uh, it's just beautiful to see examples like this and clients that we've worked with that went from on the verge of divorce to truly creating a relationship where they both really love it. Yeah. I remember working with Farron. It's like, a, it's, it's such a unique name. I was like, Oh, I, yeah. I remember that guy. And it's like, I, I know when we, when we left off, things were heading in a generally good direction. It's not, everything was 100% settled yet, but so I'm just glad that the trajectory kept going. And so I'm good to hear that he's still active in our community and sharing some wins. Oh, this is, actually, I was really pleased to see this. I, I didn't even like l- l- register the name when I was going over the notes earlier. So yeah. Yeah. So if you guys would like to hear his episode of how he turned his marriage around uh, earlier on in the process, just leave a comment, say uh, marriage turnaround. And I'll send you the link to that podcast episode so you don't miss it. You can also see it right here on our YouTube channel as well. So if you're watching us live, let us know that you can see and hear us okay. We are streaming to like five different platforms all at the same time. So I want to make sure that everything is coming in loud and clear for you guys. And let me know where you're at in your relationship. Do you feel like things have been good, but maybe not great? Do you feel like you're stuck in friend mode? Or are you like most of our audience where things are pretty dire? Your spouse is pulling away, having an affair, wanting a divorce on the verge of collapse. Okay. Let us know where you're at with that. And then I want you guys to answer this question as well and put your answer in the comments about what habits do you think support a happy relationship and how can you create those now, no matter where you might be in your relationship. We also asked this to our Facebook group and we got a a good variety of responses here. Mark, what were some of the commonalities that you saw? Well, I'm seeing, um, now I wrote my own comments on this because that's the topic of today is like habits for a, a healthy, happy marriage. Um, I'm seeing some some similar ideas, but I uh, see some themes of open communication as, as a big one. I'm seeing several comments on that. Um, other ones talking about like really making the marriage a priority or essentially like you know, that's another way of saying when they're saying set a date night every week, it's another way of saying that. But yeah, certainly some themes around like making the marriage a priority and communication are are big ones. Absolutely. And I think you guys are are nailing that with this, the habits that Mark and I are going to share with you guys, we have won them hard won them over years and years and years of our own relationships, having their ups and downs. Um, I've been married 17 years, Mark. I know you've been married a little longer. And so we found these to be true, not only in our own marriages to help them be healthy and strong and functional, but also in the tens of thousands of couples that we've now helped not only save their marriage from divorce, but to create a relationship they actually like. 
a relationship that they want to be in long-term that feels fulfilling. It's not free of challenges. And that's one of the habits we're going to talk about. So make sure you don't miss habit three at the end here, because it's really, really important. Challenges and differences and arguments are still going to happen. It's really what you do about them. One thing I really love in uh, general about habits is that they do define us. Like we are creatures of habits. It's just kind of how our brains are wired and we're programmed to try to take the path of least resistance. And there are certain studies that show that like 90% of the things we do are the exact same things that we did the day before. And that most of what we're doing is just kind of on autopilot. So if you feel like you're not getting great results in your marriage, in your life, you might want to look at some of your habits that are creating those results for you, because those habits are like the building blocks that create your experience. And when you start to change some of your habits or improve some of your habits, you start to get some very better results. So let's dive right in. Mark, the first habit for a happier relationship. Oh, we lost your audio. I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I had a technical issue there. I had to mute myself because I was trying to look at the comments and the audio was playing from our, our broadcast. <laughs> Anyways, the first the first habit um, is protect your marriage from other good things in your life. Like, like I said before, like th this is making your relationship a priority. And, and I, I worded it like this on purpose because I don't think anyone ever sets out to say, you know what? my marriage isn't that important it, that's or i don't want my relationship to be a priority that's not what anyone says it's more often that there are so many good things in in life that might be a bit more of a squeaky wheel as in it's calling our attention a bit more and so more and more our focus starts to go in other directions uh you know i'm thinking a lot especially Earlier on in, in relationships, the big, like, Heather, you know, I think everyone's aware of like these big things that tend to take our focus. These are things like focusing on the career and making money. These are things like our children needing attention. Um, sometimes we want to get some better education. We need time for ourselves or time for friends. I know in, in my family, like, we're even having some stuff like that popping up. Like as my older kids are starting to become teenagers, I kept thinking, oh, they'll be able to take care of themselves more. And I'm learning more and more that just the attention is different. <laughs> um, so my wife and I are having to have this discussion, like how do we make sure that we are taking care of these, you know, our kids, something very important and be able to have time for each other. So very relevant to my to me at least this this topic today i agree right now oh my goodness i'm teaching a teenager to drive soon to be two and i'm potty training a toddler i was just oh, looking wow. at like my life right now and these are good things uh, i've even seen hobbies or sports you know uh, just really good positive things can become like they take over your life you know um and so they start to take away some of the focus from the relationship I'm thinking of one particular couple. I'm not going to, of course, call them by name, but uh, they let wrestling take over their lives and their children's, they, they were both involved in wrestling and he was a coach and that's what their whole life was about, was wrestling. And they had no time for each other because they were constantly at practices and their weekends were taken up by traveling everywhere for the kids' sports and for him coaching and and then she was on helping with the coaching too somehow. It was just like their whole life revolved around this one thing and it crowded out their space for their relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen that like sports, kids sports, it really can take up a lot of a lot of time. And especially if you multiply that with multiple kids who are involved with sports, like my kids aren't even all that super involved with their extracurricular activities but when you start multiplying that by a few kids you know most every evening is going to be occupied with something um my, my opinion on this is like it seems to me that very few people are going to regret um like maybe a friendship that died off some 
10, 15 years ago. Like maybe, maybe there's some good friendships or, but very few people will say that they wish they spent more time with work. Um, you know, like all these little things that tend to occupy our time and take the attention away from the relationship in the long run aren't really that super consequential. Like, yeah, it's nice to have a, a good lifestyle and a, a successful career. But ultimately, I think that there's going to be a lot more regrets when relationships fail. It's my opinion. I'm, you know, maybe yeah. I'm a bit old fashioned there, but. <laughs> I saw a clip on YouTube about uh, someone that had been at the bedside of over 200 elderly people as they were at the end of their life and the things that they learned from them and, and the regrets that they had were always about time not spent with people or relationships that were not healed or failing to say, I love you, or I appreciate to someone important in their life. It was never, I wish I made more money. I wish I went on more vacations. I wish I spent more time at work or my kids went to more soccer games. It was none of those things. <laughs> and having had an experience very near to death myself, <laughs> where I was like, given a 5% chance of making it and looking at like, you know, I had this vision where I had my own funeral, right? It was a dream that came to me and I saw my own funeral and that just woke me up to what really matters most in life. And that was a gift I believe was given to me at a very young age of only 29 to help me realize those things that you are spending most of your time doing and obsessing and worrying about are not the things that really matter. And so make sure that you're making the most of the time that you have right now. And these relationships need to be nurtured and they need to be protected. So protecting your marriage is very much about helping you guys both feel like you are a priority. Mm -hmm. So your husband or your wife needs to feel like a priority and you need to feel like a priority as well. And this really helps a couple develop a sense of us, right. Versus the world. Like we're in this together. We have this connection. We have this foundation, almost like a shield around you versus like the rest of the world. And there are certain things like we've talked about that can really threaten that. One thing I also want to throw in before we go into what to do to protect it is also protecting it from other family members. <laughs> mm. Sometimes you have to protect it from other love interests or romantic interests or friendships that are maybe, you know, too involved or are uncomfortable for both partners. And sometimes it can be extended family members or in-laws, uh, even your own children. We talked about that. So just anything that that gets in the way of that feeling of us, of that unity is something that you want to examine and maybe look at like, how can we prioritize us a little more? So what do we do to get this going? Cause like, it's really easy to say, well, this is a nice habit. I think with each of these, I'd like to at least come to some simple first steps. Right. Um, I know for like for my wife and I, where we really start to make this more of a thing in our relationship is we started um, basically, <laughs> we, we, we said to each other, okay, after a certain like time each night, we're no longer parents. Like we're, we're going to have a very hard line and we're not going to deal with kid issues after this time. Now, I, I'll, I'll have to admit, like that was some years ago. And as our kids have gotten a little bit older, my wife and I probably need to revisit this because the kids are staying up a little bit later. And, you know, it's just, it's a little bit more difficult. But I do think that like having very clear boundaries or having, um, yeah, like almost harsh, and I, 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 maybe harsh is the wrong word, but very firm boundaries around the time that you have together is very important. This might mean date nights. It might mean um, specific time that you have each other just on a regular daily basis, which I think is a, is a good idea. But whatever you need to do to create like this, these walls around the time that you and your, your spouse have together is, I think, a, a really good first step. I agree. And so I'm just going to ask you guys to leave a comment here. Of how much do you feel like you are giving time and energy to your relationship each day, each week. How much time do you feel like your spouse is? How much time do you feel like you are? Do you feel like a priority to your spouse? Do you think that your spouse feels like a priority to you? And Mark, I had to laugh because I remember several years ago, you said it on this podcast about the, this is not, I'm no longer your parent after 8 yeah. p.m. <laughs> and that stood out to me so much because it was so 
clear in a kind way, like I'm here for emergencies, but we need our time, you know? And that really stood out to me um, of a powerful example that we can actually give to our children about the importance of this relationship. Yes, they're important, but kids can be little energy vampires and just suck the life out of us if we let them. But tangent here, but studies have also shown that kids feel more secure with boundaries than without boundaries. So Mm -hmm. they might kick and scream initially, especially if they're not used to boundaries, but it's really healthier for them and it's healthier for the entire family. And so, yes, we need to protect our relationship from our own children (laughs) at times. And one of my mentors uh, told me that, you know, just take 15 minutes a day to put down all distractions and have a really deep, meaningful connection. What I noticed Ben and I were doing kind of our habit was that we would say, like, put the kids to bed and then we'd go watch a show. And that was fine. It was like fine to decompress, but I felt like we weren't really like getting, I don't know. I just felt a lack of connection. And so, yes, we still will watch a show once in a while, but that 15 minutes of putting down the phones. So neither of us are checking email or Facebook or text messages or whatever. We're actually looking each other in the eye because eye contact is what builds a lot of trust and connection and intimacy and like really listening to each other is so much better than even if you have hours spent just doing kind of a, you know, meaningless distraction together. (laughs) So that 15 minutes a day is really important to me. Now my husband has gone traveling 18 days out of the month, but we still make an effort to have that 15 minute of a conversation on FaceTime if we can, so we can have that eye contact and making sure we really connect and check in with each other. And that helps us be able to understand what's going on with the other person, get to know the other person, identify if there's any needs or things that we can do to support each other, to show some appreciation, to laugh about something funny. I mean, we're always laughing. The kids always do like the most hilarious things. And my husband's a prankster, even at 40,000 feet in the air, he's still pranking people. (laughs) So it's just really joyful to be able to have that time. And it feels secure to me to know that I am a priority to him and that he's a priority to me and that we do make that time sacred. And then we also prioritize the regular date night as well. And date night are not, this time is not meant to discuss business, go on errands, don't talk about the kids, don't talk about money, don't talk about plans. This is a time to like relax and enjoy each other's company. Think about the kind of dates that you went on when you were dating, kind of like get to know you almost dates because your spouse is not the same person that you married. They're not, they're not the same person that you married 15 years ago or whatever. They're a different person now. So get to know them, show some interest in them. That's going to reignite that spark between you guys and help you really understand who they are. I think like another just easy step to take, like, I think it's easy for say you and me to say, go out and date nights, carve this time, maybe a little bit harder to actually take that, uh, take that initiative. But I think an even simpler step is just to sit down with your, your partner, have a conversation with them about what would help them to feel like a priority and then take some simple actions to make that happen. Like I'm a a big advocate for like really uh, (laughs) making the the other person feel heard. Um, So like I I generally, when I'm working with clients, I'll I'll, I'll tend to suggest like go in first and have that first conversation, focus on the other person and then come back, you know, another time and say, Hey, look, now I want to have this conversation about myself and like what I need to feel like a priority, but you know, whatever works for, for the two of you. I think this is a a very simple step that can be taken. Like most people can commit to a conversation or two about priorities. As long as there's some follow-up, I think this would be a really great place to start. Yeah. Now I want to just um, put a note in here that Mark and I are talking about a generally healthy, more stable relationship (laughs) with these kind of conversations. Um, We're not talking about being on the verge of divorce and having major affairs and no communication. So with that being said, we always want to make sure we solve problems in order. If you're pushing for a lot of time with your partner right now and they're pulling away from you, again, that's going to backfire. So you want to make sure that you're applying the right I guess, habits or actions, the right behaviors at the right stage of your relationship. But Mark, I have seen even couples that were really struggling, be able to still communicate this idea that you're important to me. Your happiness is important to me. 
this relationship is important to me. And I've seen couples that were even struggling change some of their priorities to demonstrate that they were listening to their spouse and understanding where their spouse was coming from. And so no matter what stage you might be in, there are still principles that you can take from this, but you need to make sure that you're doing them at the right time. So that's why Mark and I are here. We go to you one-on-one on how to navigate through the different stages and make sure that what you're doing isn't backfiring. I can easily see someone listening to this and be like, okay, I just got to go show her. I'm going to spend more time with her and prioritize her. And then she's just like, ah, you know, cause it's not the right time. <laughs> so yeah. you want to do the, the smaller bids for connection, the smaller bids for prioritizing things. Um, if you're in one of the, you know, more dire states of a relationship. All right. With that being said, is, yeah, I think this is a good segue into that that second habit, which is developing a positive story, because like Heather was describing there, there are some circumstances where a, a spouse might not be receptive to like a lot of action where they would be be made a priority, like they're not going to be accepting of date nights or like one on one time together. Um, even still, I think developing a healthy story, you can mostly implement this at just about any stage, even if like they are a little bit resistant to those things. Um, I do think that healthy couples are ones that actively build up a positive image of each other and the relationship because um, just it's, it's a fact. Pretty much every relationship is going to have some problems and it's a big deal uh, and how that couple ends up like describing those problems. It, it can make a world of difference to say, okay, we're having this problem and my wife doesn't care because she didn't ask me about my day this morning. And so therefore, you know, like this, like there's absolutely no love. Like we could take that very same situation and we could say, oh, we're having this problem. My wife didn't ask me about how my day was it's probably because she's stressed. And, you know, if I actually sat down and talked with her, she probably would sit down and listen to me and uh, about like my concerns. Uh, it's a very different, all, all that internal monologue about describing what's going on. And that internal monologue, those, those beliefs that are behind it, it's, it's so crucial, I think, to having a very healthy relationship. I don't know, like, what do you think, Heather? Like, what, what kind of stories are important to build within a relationship. Oh, so I have to laugh about this one because like you said, it's, it applies to all, all the stages of your relationship, no matter where you are at. And I have really struggled with having a positive view of Ben and having a positive view of myself or the relationship. And so if you can relate to that, leave a comment, let me know what's going on for you. Um, but even this morning, I was working through something that happened yesterday there was a boundary that I was wanting to set with an extended family member. And it didn't feel like Ben was supportive. It felt like he kept trying to push me to not have that boundary and kind of justify what this extended family member was doing. And so that I was, I was working through that at around five in the morning (laughs) and I was looking at this exact thing. Like I could describe the problem as Ben cares more about this other person, extended family member than he does about me. He's always trying to manipulate me. And like, I'll be honest, there's some thoughts that are still there. So I have to be the one that checks those assumptions and I have to look at, okay, is there another way of looking at this? Okay. I could look at this, that Ben really loves for people to get along. He really hates contention. He really wants to have everyone feel good and safe and and happy about things. And so rather than him siding with this person, I could see it as he's actually trying to build a bridge. He's trying to see if there can be a compromise made for me. There is not a compromise that can be made in this situation. But I can see, I can start to describe his part in this with good intent. And I can go back to the truths that I know that Ben loves me, that Ben is supportive of me and that, that he's there for me instead of he doesn't care. So I can easily still, I can still easily get swayed. (laughs) And so I have to be very mindful of what I put on him. Now I know that some of you are like, well, my husband, like it really doesn't care. He doesn't he doesn't respect me. He doesn't listen to me. Like you're talking about how Ben is there for you. Well, I like, he's not there for me. He's cheating on me, blah, 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 blah. Well, this is where you get to create the new story. And this is the way that we get to describe the relationship that we want to see and build 
a new reality for the relationship. And it might seem delusional. Okay. It might seem delusional. You're like, he's doing this. He's sleeping with another woman. And you're saying, Heather, just create the story that he loves me and I'm safe and secure. Yeah, I am saying that <laughs> it doesn't make, it doesn't make maybe logical sense, but the more that you focus on the wall, like remember the race car driver, the more you focus on the wall and the things that you don't want, the more you're going to get them in your relationship because you feed that story. You add more to it. You get more upset, makes him more defensive. The same patterns that created this situation in the first place continue, or they actually get worse and worse and worse and make an even bigger negative story. That's what most people do. So what Mark and I are saying is focus on where you want to go, focus more on what you're wanting to create and have than what you're wanting to avoid and what you don't want, because there's power in that. And we've seen people do this. And it's amazing when you get to the place where you're like, like, I know that they're doing that, but I also know where I'm going and I know what I'm going to create in the relationship. And you take ownership of what you're creating about the story and the story that you are telling. So I think this is really a powerful principle and it applies to everyone, no matter where you are. I did see a comment here um, in the Facebook group. What if you communicate about feelings? She's asking, and he thinks that it's just being mad or acting defensive when it's hardly not that it feels like not listening and connecting. And so now this is where we get to see like your husband has a story about you that when you share your feelings, you're mad and he gets defensive about it. And you probably also have a story as well. He's not listening. He's not connecting. He's not understanding. And so then you continue to play out that same pattern. What Mark and I help you do is to identify what that pattern is and to change it, interrupt that pattern. So then you can start to create the new story. I think like with, you know, Leanne and the, the comment there, and, you know, if we have to apply this to the, this habit, I think it would be fairly easy to develop more of a story of like, hey, we want to build up a situation where we can share some feelings. Like that's a story that you can build. Like maybe you're not there right now. And you know, like my approach to this is um, like, I, I don't I don't want to have the story that's being built like this. You're using the word delusional. I, I actually try to steer away <laughs> from things that are like inherently just untrue. Yeah. But there's a lot of wiggle room in there. And there's a lot of wiggle room in how you interpret things. So like for Leanne, it would be about like, okay, we want to build up better communication. And then it becomes easy to then have follow-up questions be like, okay, how do we share feelings and not create this defensiveness or not like not have this situation where you think that I'm mad at you? You know, have, having that conversation then allows for the there to be a lot of solutions um, because if the story is we want to have this open communication we want to be able to support each other we want to be able to share our feelings if that's the story that you are trying to build then a lot of the solutions flow from there yeah i agree mark that's a lot that's a lot more what we do and <laughs> that's a lot more what i do as well is starting small with saying like there's safety in communicating it feels really good to understand each other. It feels really good to understand where my spouse is coming from. So comment for you guys, what kind of story do you want to have in your marriage? What story do you each want to actively build within your marriage? And Mark, you have some simple steps here to kickstart this habit. Yeah. So I think a good place to start is like really getting clear on what you are wanting for yourself within the relationship. Like if I have to to give some examples, uh, I know one of the things that I tried to build for my own self within my marriage with with Jennifer, um, I really try to build up this idea of feeling heard. Um, I want to make sure that Jen and I can share f feelings and that the other person is is ab able to listen. Like, yes, some of that involves my wife, but we'll get to that in a second. But it's important to, <laughs> at least come up from a, like this base of understanding what I'm actually wanting. Sometimes Heather and I talk about this, like being about um, being clear with your requests. But I think a lot of people go into these sort of situations and are a little bit nebulous with what they want. So part of this can be just like having 
clear definitions of, of those wants and desires. So if like, I want to feel respected, okay, what does that mean? What does that look like? And, you know, what, what kind of actions might be taken? What kind of things would I be saying differently? And things like that. Um, so once you are clear on your request, it, it can be important for you to decide on some actions that you yourself can do to help support this story. And then whether your partner is going to be participating or not, depending on how healthy the situation is, I would still recommend sharing your plan with your spouse. So for example, if you want to build up that idea of respect, you might say, okay, respect means that we're not going to swear at each other during arguments, which was actually something that I was just talking about with a client earlier today. Um, so part of that might mean, you know, on my end, if that's that the, that's the story that I want to build, like I want to respect each other and we have some boundaries around language. Okay. That means on my end, I'm going to hold my partner accountable. I'm going to, I'm going to call them out a little bit in a gentle way when there is some inappropriate language, when they are escalating things beyond what is appropriate. And I'm going to then, you know, then you would tell, you know, your, your partner saying, okay, hey, look, just letting you know, this isn't okay. I want to really build up some respect in our relationship. I might call you out a little bit, but it's mostly because I want for interactions to go smoother. So being clear with requests, deciding on some actions that you can take for yourself, sharing your plan, I think is a good way to start. Agreed. I like that a lot. For me, I was like, my story I wanted to create was at first I wanted passion and fun and like this deep connection. And of course I still want that. And that, that is there, but more often than not, it's like, I just want safety in the relationship. And so I would mm -hmm. think about like, okay, what are some things I can do to create more safety? Because I don't feel very safe here. And I know Ben doesn't. And when he pulls away, I know it's because he doesn't feel safe and he doesn't want to open up and share. And I would like a relationship where we can open up and share. If you're having a hard time thinking about the story that you want to create, just think about the things you don't like and then find their opposite. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't like that they're cheating on you, I want a trusting, secure relationship. If you don't like that they're you know, volatile and angry and defensive, I, I like that communication can be open and secure and, um, and honest, right? So as I thought about, I want to create safety, especially around Ben sharing, then what are some actions I could take? Well, when he does share, I'm going to make that rewarding. I'm going to let him know that I appreciate that he shared. I'm not going to get, you know, into the pattern of immediately getting defensive about whatever he just said. I'm going to listen to understand, right? I'm going to try to have some empathy and put myself in his shoes. And so um, creating those actions is what helps to create that new story. All right, let's go to the third one. And this one is about, remember, I said, everyone's going to need this one. So better pay attention. <laughs> this one is keeping communication open. Yes. Every single couple I've ever asked, no matter how long they've been married or how happy they are, I ask, what is the one thing you feel like you could do to improve your marriage? It's always communication. It's always communication because we need to be able to do two things, right? As a couple, we need a clear avenue to discuss issues different topics and get support for those wants or those needs. And we need a clear avenue to discuss concerns and get support for those solutions. And because men and women are different and we have different personalities and you and your spouse have different communication styles, it's really important that we get to a place where we can understand each other and we can have open feedback and open dialogue to be able to share and feel safe about it as well as to address any underlying issues. Yeah, I'm thinking once again, back to Leanne's comment, um, she was saying, okay, well, what if you communicate about your feelings and thinks it's you being mad? I would say here is like a, a prime example where these avenues for sharing things are not very clear. Like they're like, sure, maybe on the surface, they the couple might say, yeah, we can talk about anything, maybe. But like, here's this very clear obstacle to being able to share some deeper things that need to be discussed. Um, I am imagine, you know, I can only make assumptions here with Leanne's situation, but if it's being perceived as mad, I'm going to assume that these there's some complaints or concerns that are being brought up or some more negative feelings that Leanne is wanting to be resolved. There needs to be a clear way to do that within the relationship Otherwise, we get the situation where, you know, like either one, 
the uh, it turns into an argument and escalates and it blows up and probably doesn't get resolved. Or two, the situation gets avoided and eventually swept under the rug. And in either case, the given enough time that that's going to cause the relationship to to deteriorate. Similarly, like that that whole thing was just about discussing problems. Similarly, if you keep coming to the relationship and say, hey, I need this, I need to feel a little bit more connected. I want to feel a little bit closer to you. I want to feel like we can accomplish some goals together. And you keep getting shut down or there keeps being like, nah, let's, let's not talk about anything serious. Let's just have, have some fun. Like if there's this continual dismissal, that's going to really develop into a situation where like there's just increased distance. Like, this is going to be the situation where you have that I love you, but I'm not in love with you or like where you just drift apart and you feel like roommates uh, if you, if given enough time. So we need avenues for both those things. Thoughts, Heather? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and those, that's what really creates the like, healthy functional relationship that we're talking about. And so just imagine what it would feel like to have a relationship where you can go to your partner about anything, right? And you know that there will be respect, there will be openness, there will be follow through. You know, I don't know about you, Mark, but I can't think of anyone who wouldn't want that. <laughs> we all want to feel accepted for who we really are and to feel safe enough to share anything. And I know that that's a big part of what you and Jen have created in your relationship. And I am working to create that as well. Um, working through some of those barriers to that openness, but the more that we communicate that it's safe to share, it's safe to let me know how you're feeling. It's safe to express how you're really feeling. It's safe to give me feedback, right? And we work together on that. Then that creates that new story around communication and in the relationship itself. So let's talk about now some simple steps that we can take to start on this habit. Sure. I think um, some very good first steps is simply to invite your partner to say whatever they want about the relationship. Now, your role in this conversation is to respond simply by listening and asking questions to get better understanding. Uh, I would really recommend that for this first time that you have no other objective for yourself you just you're trying to invite the other person to open up so be curious about like some of their wants and needs be curious about some of their concerns and just ask questions why i'm suggesting that you give a lot more focus on your partner rather than like trying to balance that out at least this time is because i'm assuming that if this is a difficult situation for you that if you're needing to build this habit up then something is preventing the two of you from, from having this communication flow. And I would say, you know, if you're in the, the, the spot where you're researching how to make your relationship better, I'm going to assume that you're probably in a little bit better position for me to ask you to, to go first and to, to, to take some action that might be a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, I always find that it's a little bit easier to balance it out or ask for some things in return when you've offered it first. So rather than saying, okay, hey, look, I'm going to sit you down and you need to listen to me. And I want you to just understand what I have to say. That's, there's going to, it's much more likely you're going to be running into some resistance rather than if you go to your partner and say, hey, look, things have been rough. And I want to understand what it is that you're looking for. And all I want to do is ask some questions. Um, I don't need this to be about me at this time. I, I can guarantee you that um, unless things are really, really bad in terms of communication, that your partner is much more likely to open up with a with an invitation like that. Right. And that goes to our path method, which is all about like getting perspective. And the first steps that we want to take is taking the pressure off, right? Having no agenda and really trying to understand where they're coming from. And as you do that, your partner is going to feel heard. They're going to feel more respected. They're going to feel like, wow, he or she actually is trying to understand me now. Uh, and it can be, it can be challenging to break through some of those patterns, especially if you have a habit of getting very defensive and kind of blaming them or putting it back on them and, and getting really riled up by what they're saying. Um, but this 
invitation here to allow your partner to say whatever they want about the relationship can be immensely healing. It's going to be kind of ugly for many people and many marriages because it's kind of like draining a wound. My daughter just got an abscess two weeks ago and it was gross and it had to be lanced and drained before it could get better because the infection was not going to come out on its own. And so it's kind of like what this invitation is, is to like, let's get the the yuck out so that we can start to heal what's going on underneath instead of continually sweeping it under the rug or pretending it's not there or them avoiding it, you avoiding it, or blowing up into something bigger. Uh, It's a really powerful practice to get into, to really invite your spouse to share and to try to understand their perspective. It's what's going to help open that door. I see a comment here, um, Nicholas made, I can't get past the wall. I'll try to communicate, but she never replies to anything. So if you relate to what Nicholas is saying, comment seven conversation starters. That's kind of long. Just comment the number seven and I'll know what you're talking about. (laughs) We have a, we have a seven proven conversation starters guide that works for any stage of relationship, but especially if they're giving you like, just like one word answers to help get the conversation going to help them feel safer to open up. It's going to be a bit of a process, but the more you create safety about around communication, the more willing they're going to be uh, to communicate in the future. Seven. Awesome. Got it. Seven. <laughs> I will send you guys that guide right after the masterclass or not after masterclass, the podcast. That's what we're doing. <laughs> awesome. Any final thoughts on keeping communication open, Mark? Um. Where did I go with all? I, I'm opening up different windows, looking at. Okay, there we are. Um, you know what? I think I think we've gone over this as as much as we can today. But uh, I, all I want to say is, you know, with each of these, one of our my purposes in talking about some of this, you know, with each habit, we were talking a little bit about where can you start, mm-hmm. and that's the the final thought I want to leave, leave you all with is no matter where you are at with your problems, with your relationship, even if things are going really well, you know, no matter where you're at in the spectrum, there's always like a next step that you can, you can work towards to make things better. So like for my wife and I, we're, we're doing pretty good. We, we have some good communication. We have some good connection. And even still like there's occasionally we'll have conversations or like, we really appreciate what, how things are. We, we, and yeah, we can still talk about where we want things to be better. Um, if things are going poorly, there's always a next step, even if it's something small. So I want you to keep that in mind. Um, I mean, this, this is specifically what Heather and I focus on uh, in a lot of cases is like finding that next little step to, to move the needle a little bit so that we can then <laughs> take another little step and another little step and keep that progression going to the point that we can actually get the other partner involved in wanting to fix things. So love that. So if you want more help from us, comment breakthrough, and we will send you a link or have a private conversation with you over in Facebook messenger, wherever you are, uh, on whatever platform you are, (laughs) we'll make sure we get you that link so that you can have a one-on-one conversation with us on how we can help you get from where you are to where you want to be in your marriage. And this process works even if they're on the verge of divorce, even if they're saying, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. They're having an affair, multiple affairs, or you're currently separated. So just comment breakthrough and I will get that to you guys as well. All right. Lastly is our marriage myth buster, which is happy couples never argue or disagree. I've also heard a different reiteration of this one. It's kind of like, if we're arguing or disagreeing, then something's broken and wrong. And our marriage is like over. (laughs) <laughs> so Mark, what is your take on this? Myth? So I can see where this comes from. Like no one really wants a relationship where there's a lot of arguments. Even further, um, my observation is that early on in relationships, it actually is pretty normal for that a couple to almost never have disagreements or arguments. I, I don't know about you, Heather, but like, when I was first married, um, that first year or so, I don't think Jen and I really fought a whole lot. Um, we had a plenty of time to focus on each other. We had, we didn't have as many responsibilities. We didn't have any kids. Um, things were pretty good. 
but uh, and I, I think that's I, I'm not going to say that's 100% like all couples, but I, I do think that like this is a little bit where that myth comes from is because there tends to be a, this period where there is a lot less or very little or perhaps even no arguments at all. And I think a lot of that is what helps us to like really build that relationship up and how, why we can have create that deeper relationship is because there's almost <laughs> all good on that early stage. But over and time, in that early stage, I'm just going to point out, they're usually doing all three of those habits we just talked about. They're yes. prioritizing each other. There's a high amount of attention on each other. Um, they have a positive view of each other, a positive view of the relationship, and they have open communication. So again, yep. reiterating the power of those three habits. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why, why that's the case. Um, I, I could go into that at length. You know, it has a lot to do with, you know, it's harder to have arguments when there's not as much depth to the relationship beyond that, the, what I call a reward cycle. There's a very quick reward cycle of like, uh, I'm going to share something and I'm rewarded by it. I'm going to go a little bit deeper. I'm, I'm rewarded by it. Like that tends to be a quicker cycle in the early stages, but anyways, not the point here. Um, over time, it's inevitable that couples will find reasons to disagree. And this is not like a problem. This is just, what happens? Um, it's really hard to have a, a big blowout argument about the dishes if we don't live together. <laughs> like, what is there to argue about? Or it's it's hard to have an argument about how you're raising your kids when you don't have kids. Mm. So, like, as you um, as the couple progresses and there's more and more ties, there's more and more little things that are bringing you together, and the relationship deepens. It actually is. It is easier to see all the differences that um, that are there, that were always there, it just never came up. So the important piece is how the couple approaches disagreements and what the outcome ends up being. Um, much more. That's much more important than whether arguments exist, because, like even Gottman, like the big name Gottman, Gottman talks about like different. Uh, relationship types. And one of the, the stable relationship types is this volatile, volatile relationship where two people are vol volatile. And why is that a stable relationship? Is because, yes, the arguments might be volatile, but the outcomes are generally positive. Um, it, usually those kind of couples end on really passionate, positive notes. Um, so like generally speaking, intense arguments can be okay as long as in the end, everyone is feeling that their position is considered and heard. It's even better, though, when each person's side of the argument can be openly expressed and considered. Now, remember how we were just talking about a little bit ago how it's good to encourage feedback and maybe even complaints when we we're talking a little bit about like in terms of um, keeping communication open. It turns out that couples that never argue or disagree, in my experience, tend to be the ones that do not have healthy ways to discuss differences. Um, on our end, if a client is telling me that there were never arguments, my immediate thought is that, um, okay, there's something off here. I'm, I immediately become curious whether one of the partners is maybe pushing down some feelings or maybe sweeping concerns under the rug. And usually that, uh, that suspicion is confirmed in, in some other ways. So basically what I'm getting at here is really the the myth of happy couples never argue or disagree is it's it's actually the complete opposite i would expect happy couples to have healthy ways to argue and disagree um that's the the much better situation rather than never arguing or disagreeing yeah. beautiful love it so much thank you mark and thank you all for joining us today Comment what you learned and what habits you're going to create. If you identify that some of your habits and patterns are not creating a great result for you, what are you committed to change right now? What is an action step that you can take in the next 24 hours to be able to move your relationship towards a healthier and happier direction? All right. Next week, we're going to share with you unpacking the I hate you bomb and mm -hmm. why your spouse might say it and what it actually means. This one's going to surprise you. We're excited to share it with you. So thank you for joining us today again. And thank you, Mark. We cannot wait to see your marriage thrive.